morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Philippians chapter 1. We're finally going to end chapter 1 today. Uh, it's been a great chapter. There's so much in here. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, so we're going to take two weeks today and next Sunday to do this section um, that's actually verse 27 through two, chapter 2, verse 11. So we'll be looking at that, uh, and we're going to cover mainly just verse 27 through the end of the chapter today. Um, so if you have your Bibles, you'll stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning. We're starting verse 27, and we're going to read through chapter 2, verse 5 this morning. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves." Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning, Lord, that is the truth, uh, that is a light in the midst of darkness. Lord, it is the truth in the midst of lies, a culture, Lord, just with so many voices. Lord, we thank you that your word Lord, regardless of time, regardless of culture, it is the truth, the rock on which we stand. And we just praise you. And Lord, we praise you as we've sung this morning, Lord, just for who you are. And God, I pray that even now as we're praying and Lord, all the things that we've already sung, that we would behold you, who you are, the almighty, infinite, all-powerful God, Lord, eternal always have been, always will be, creator of all things. Lord, who is like you? And and as we, Lord, meditate and and behold who you are, Lord, all of our issues and problems just seem to get very small because of the greatness of who you are. And we just give you praise and honor and glory. Lord, may we have hearts this morning overflowing with thankfulness because of who you are. And God, that you have lavished your love and your grace upon us. And so we give you thanks this morning. And Lord, pray that you would take your word and speak into the innermost part of our being. Lord, I pray that your spirit would grab a hold of our heart and our mind and our will this morning. That we might hear and respond by faith to your word. And Lord, may we be a church that walks as one man, contending for the faith of the gospel. We pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So, have you ever prayed for patience? <laughs> Who's prayed for patience? Anybody? Yeah. And what always happens when you pray for patience? You get trials, right? It's amazing how that works, isn't it? And, you know, it, and, uh, it's, what's even more amazing is how we keep praying for patience, <laughs> knowing what's coming. But why do we get trials when we pray for patience? Because there's only one way to learn patience, right? And that's going through trials. There's only one way. And so it's the same way as you think about joy. If you're praying for joy, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get trials. Uh, you know, and, and it, it, sometimes we look at that as, as uh, Lord, why are you doing this? And yet, one, we've asked for help, right? To, we want to have joy. Um. We want to have patience, and so God gives us the one thing that helps us with that, and that's trials. Uh, you know, and again, we've been looking at that joy has nothing to do with circumstances. And yet we continue, you know, it's so hard in America in, in how we've been raised and in, in how we've, in our culture, that we want to make all of our circumstances smooth and easy, 
and we think that will bring joy. And yet, it's just not reality. You know, I, I remember the first time I was going through this Chip Ingram study on marriage, and, and he said, you know, he said, this, this thing of that you're going to have a marriage with no conflict is just not reality. And I sat there and went, yeah, that's, yeah. Why didn't I think of that before, right? That we live in a fallen world, and, you know, but, but our society and all these romance novels and all this stuff that, you know, that a good marriage is one that has no conflict. You know, that's one that has no communication, right? Because, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just not reality that there's going to be conflict in any good relationship. And what makes it better is as you work through conflict and you're stronger on the other side. It's the same thing as we think about our lives with, with circumstances, with trials. To think that we're going to have a, a life of no trials and to even work for that is just not reality. Because we live in a fallen world. And if, you know, it, it's, it's amazing when you read through the New Testament... <laughs> I mean, all the people that love God, all they got were trials. A whole lot of them, right? That, that we, that all of us have not experienced what they went through. It's amazing. And yet, you know, somehow, and I think it's just part of our culture that we think, and, and what's crept into Christianity, that we think following Jesus means it's going to be easy and smooth sailing. You know, like when I used to watch the love boat when I was a kid. You know, just going to sail off into the sunset and everything's going to be great, you know, and always had a great ending and it's just not reality. And so I just want to, you know, say to you this morning, if you're going through a difficult time, if you're really struggling, and, and I know some of our people are going through some really hard, difficult things, that just like what we sang this morning, to stop and behold who he is. He is the almighty, awesome, amazing, eternal God. Who, and, and we can always look to the cross and know that he loves us, know that he's faithful, know that he will never leave us or forsake us because of the cross. And, and, and stop and, and take time not to look at, you know, what he's done for me, but just behold who he is. And may, our, may the prayer in your heart today and in, in, in mine be Christ, be magnified. Right? Isn't that what we just looked at last week with Paul? That his one passion was Christ be exalted, be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, that's what we just looked at. And so I want to encourage you with that this morning to, to, to take the focus, whatever you're dealing with today, and take it and, and fix it upon Christ. Behold the greatness of who he is. Look at his word. Read his word. And, and allow what God says of who he is to encourage you with the, the greatness of who he is. Because when you see the greatness of God, you realize that the trials we go, we're going through are not too difficult for him. And that for thousands of years, he's led his people through unbelievable heartache and trial and death and all kinds of things. Uh, and the greatness of our God. And, and may, you know, again, as we, we face these issues and these trials, may the cry of our heart be Christ be magnified. Because that changes everything, doesn't it? Right? Because, you know, as you think about it, the joy of the Lord is the greatest in the darkest of times. I want to say that again, because that, that is so important that you get this this morning. The joy of the Lord is the greatest in the darkest of times. That's when His joy, His love, His peace are magnified and shown to be all-powerful in the very darkest of times. And I mean, again, you know, you look at, at the guys and men and women of Scripture, and you look at the men and women in the history of, church, of the church, you know, and, and those who go through horrific things, what you see in them and what you hear from them is this joy of the Lord. It, 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 it just, it doesn't make sense 
right? It's not natural because it's supernatural. It's the joy of the Lord. And know that however dark it might be or however dark it might get in your life, that the Lord wants to give you a joy that will supersede and overflow even those dark times. I mean, he's been doing it since the history of mankind. That's what God does for his people. You know, think about it. I mean, how many Red Seas, fiery furnaces, stonings, floggings has God, have God's people walked through? I mean, Hosea said, you know, if there's no fruit on the vine, if all the fields are barren, if there's nothing I will exalt the Lord. Because in those times is when God with his people gives us a joy that is it's supernatural. It, it, it's not based on us or our circumstances. It's based on him. And that's what Paul has been telling this church in, in, Philippi, in the, uh, Philippi, uh, Philippi. Sorry. So think about what James said. Consider it all what? Joy. When what? When everything's smooth and great. When my football team wins. Right? No, when you encounter trials, various or many different types of trials. Man, is this guy crazy or what? Knowing that the testing, here's why you count it joy. Knowing the testing of your faith, which who's testing our faith? The Lord is, because he loves us, produces endurance. You know, Hebrews 12, you know, tells us that it's out of endurance. It's because of being tested in endurance that we endure. And, and so, knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And right in Romans 8, who is Jesus molding us in? I mean, who is God molding us into? Conform us into the image of Christ. And if Christ had to suffer... Right? He, I mean, that was how God worked in his life, that we're going to go through things. And so the trials that we go through, remember that the Lord is producing in you endurance so that you can be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And, and so, again, we, we know this in our own lives. Like, if you've ever played sports, if, you, if you've ever been in a, a job, I, I mean, anything... That where you're going to mature and grow and progress, you have to go beyond what's comfortable, right? At sports, you push yourself. Practices are awful. You know, I remember my coach, my college coach, practices are going to be so terrible that when you get to a game, it's going to just be fun because practices were so awful. And they were. He put trash cans on each end of the court and said, don't throw up on my court, right? I mean, that's just how it was. But we, you know, that was this whole thing of pushing ourselves to become better. And we know that with so many things, you can't be comfortable and grow and mature and get better at something if there's no pushing of yourself. And God wants us to be like Christ. And so he's going to push us. I mean, I mean, think about Stephen being martyred. Jesus said the church is going to go to Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And they said, well, we just like Jerusalem. We think we're just going to stay here. <laughs> and God shoved him out of Jerusalem through the martyrdom of Stephen because he wanted the gospel to go to the ends of the earth. And we can look at God as harsh, but that's where we have to remember the cross, that God loves us and he wants us to grow and be like Christ. Today we're going to look at the joy of unity. Think about a sports team. I like sports. I remember my coach, and maybe you've heard this, there's no I in what? <laughs> Team, right? I mean, I think, I don't know whoever came up with that, but the first, you know, all coaches, I think, say that now. There's no I in team, right? You can't be self-centered uh, and be on a team. Paul is going to use a verb that we're going to see here that talks about athletics and specifically athletics as a team. It's really interesting. Uh, and so we're going to look at that. But you remember the movie, Remember the Titans? Anybody ever seen that? That's one of those classics, right? Such a great, great movie based on a true story. And you know the story, there's an African-American football team and a white football team, and they're trying to put these two together in a time of great segregation, right? And they're trying to bring these two teams together. 
And, and so then you have an African-American coach and a white coach, and they were both head coaches, and you're trying to put them together. And there's just this strife because of uh, racism. And, and these guys, and the whole movie, if you've seen it, you remember how they, they put aside their differences. They begin to learn the, the other culture of who their teammate is. They begin to have a love for one another. Why? Because there was a purpose that was greater than their racism, and that was winning the state title. They wanted to win, and so they were willing, and, and that's what helped them. I mean, and if you remember the movie, the practices that Coach Brooke took them through, they were grueling. And they continued. A couple of the guys quit because they didn't want to be with somebody from another race. But the guys stuck it out. And then, and then you see at the, the end as you know, they're winning, but you see this love and this bond between these guys that, that would never have been together. And it's a great picture of, of what the Lord and, and what we're going to see here with what Paul is talking about, the unity of the church, um, that... The, the whole thing about a, a team putting aside ourself for a greater purpose. And there's so many different, you know, sports analogies, you know, teams that have, have overcome um, because um, of this great purpose that, that moves beyond, it's greater than themselves. And so they come together to win and so, if you think about this, how much greater is the purpose that God has given the church than winning a title, right? We're going to see that today. But I want you to keep that in your mind this morning as we think about the church. We have this great purpose, and that in order for us to be able to fulfill that, we have to set aside ourselves and use our, what God's given us together to accomplish this great purpose. You can't have a bunch of individuals, right? There's some great teams. That, I mean, some teams that had great players that never did hardly anything at all because they couldn't work together. We're going to talk about one of those a little bit later uh, that is amazing um, and a guy that could finally got them to be able to work together. But can you imagine coaching a pro team? <laughs> You got a bunch of millionaires, top 1% athletes in the world, and you're going to tell them to do something? That'd be hard to do, wouldn't it? Imagine bringing the best of those together and trying to get them to work together. It's hard. But God has brought us together um, to, for this one purpose that Paul's going to give us this morning. So in our text, in Philippians 1, I want to just recap because we just skimmed through the, at the end last week. Uh, in verse 22, you know, Paul's talking about, I want to go and be with Christ. That's very much better. But he says, but if I'm to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose, but I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to, to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I'll remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. So Paul says there's these two, here's these two things. He said, I'm hard pressed. It's like two walls pressing in. You know, if you've ever seen a movie or you've been in a place that there's these rock walls and they're narrowing, and you get to a place that it's pressing you in. That's what he's talking about. That's the, the picture that he gives here. And one is exalting Christ and, and wanting to be with Christ in heaven. The other is the need of the church. And so Paul says here, um, you know, the, and, and I want to point this out. These are the two things of Paul's life. Exalting Christ, wanting to be with him, and the church. Not a bunch of other stuff. And I want to just stress as we go through this, the importance of the church and, you, and it being a, the huge part of your life. That, that's, that is so important that we see that here. That is Paul, the only reason he's staying on earth is for the progress and joy of the church. Nothing else. 
You know, and, and so much of, of American Christianity is the church is just this other thing in our lives. And if I, if I have some time or there's nothing better going on, I'll be there and be a part of it. That's not what Paul... I mean, this is the part of his life. And in verse three, chapter 3, verse 17, he says, you need to do what you see in me. The pattern of my life, you need to follow that. So it's not just like, well, that's just the Apostle Paul. It doesn't apply to us. But, but I, I want you to see, you know, why does Paul stay on the earth? Why is Jesus keeping in there? He says, for the progress and joy of the church. Paul says, if I stay, that's going to mean fruitful labor. That means people are going to come to Christ. The gospel is going to go forward. And you as a church, Philippians, are going to progress. You're going to move forward, and you're going to be full of joy because of the work of the Lord in and through me. And so Paul tells the Philippians the key to their progress and joy is their unity in the gospel. That's important. So again, think about progress. Are we progressing as an individual, as a believer in Christ, but also as a church? Progress means what? I'm, I'm moving forward. I'm gaining ground, right? I'm not going backwards. Like, it's like swimming, right? You can only tread water for so long, and you're either going to have to sink or swim, right? And so here, Paul says, I'm going to stay. God's having me stay for your progress, your growth, your moving forward, and your joy. And, and so he tells them that. And then he goes into this, verse 27, um, through this section and look what he says there in verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So here's Paul. I really want to be with Jesus. i got to stay here because the Lord has work for me to do for your progress and joy, and I'm going to give you one thing. That's what the word only, if you're in your notes, this is number two, only, he starts only, in the Greek, this is even in the Greek, this is placed at the beginning for emphasis. He's giving emphasis here, pointing to one thing above all. And what's the one thing above all for their progress and joy in the faith is they conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel and they strive in striving together with one mind, one heart, for the gospel of Christ. That's what he says. So only, this is the thing, above all, that he's going to give them for their progress and joy. So we're just going to work through that. What does it mean? What is conduct yourselves? The word conduct in the Greek, the, the root of this word is polis, which, is, which means a citizen of a free state. So back in Bible times, if you were a Roman... That was a big deal. You know, if you read through Acts, you'll see, you know, I was reading this morning in Acts 16, and, and so, you know, where Paul is in Philippi, and when you remember when they, they take him and they beat him and Silas and they throw him in jail, you know, and, uh, and, they, were, and they go to the, the magistrates and they say, these Jews are messing up our state, our country, because we're Romans, you know, in, in the Corinthians, Paul is attacking our gods and he's messing up our society. And so in these times, whether you, if you were a Roman or whatever free state you belonged to, there was a real sense of pride. Like, I'm a Roman. And, and there, was, there was pride that went with that and, and, they, and wanting to, their state or their society to succeed. And so when Paul says, conduct yourselves... He's telling us that he's, and they would understand this, that we are to be an honorable citizen of what? Of America? Who does he say? Remember, look, turn, just flip over the page to chapter 3, verse 20. Our citizenship is where? In heaven. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. That's above whether you're an American or whether you're, you know, uh, you know, a Jew or whether you're from Asia or, or wherever, Europe. 
We are citizens. If you're a believer in Christ, you're born again, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. And so Paul tells them, you need to act like a citizen of the kingdom of God. Conduct yourselves. And, and that's what this means is to be an honorable citizen of God's kingdom. Citizens would use all that they had, and they saw this as their joyable duty to ha- use what I have for the progress and the honor of the society that I was a part of. And so, when, you know, they, you know, if you remember with, with Corinth and, you know, when, and in their, their gods and goddesses, and you know, and they're when they're so mad at Paul because he's messing all the worship of their their God, you know, and, and they had this pride of who they were. And and so that was huge in that time. In our day, like, why would you want to be a citizen of America? Right? Our society is trying to shove this down as it's a terrible thing to be a citizen of America. So think about it, if you have no standards for a citizen, then you have no what? You have no country. The standards of a society is what tells you that you're a citizen of that society. And so as Paul speaking, and and we are facing that in America, right? We don't need any standards. Right? It doesn't matter. Let's open everything and everybody just whatever. You know, whatever you are on the political spectrum, it's not what we're talking about. But understand in what we see here and what was we understand even from societies in Bible times, there were certain standards and honor from being a citizen of a nation. And Paul's focusing in on here, you're a citizen of the kingdom of God, so act like it. That's what he's telling them. And that's important for us today. This was a big deal of what he's telling them to do when he says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Think about this push in our society to put everyone in a group. Right? Whether you're a, you know, a white or, or black or Asian or you're transgender or homosexual or straight. Or, there's this push to put everyone in a group. And every group has their own agenda. Is that how God set up the church? Look at Colossians here. And having put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So I want to make this really clear, because we need to hear this this morning. When you, if, when God saved you, He pulled you out of your culture and put you into the church. You're part of the church, of the kingdom of God, and that is where your citizenship lies. I mentioned this before, and I was watching this YouTube video of Vody Bakum. He's an African-American pastor, super, man, really intelligent guy, uh, great preacher. And he's, he's, he's talking to this, this uh, African-American lady and this white lady. And he's trying to explain to them, I'm not a black Christian. I'm a Christian who happens to be black. You're not, he said to this lady, you're not a white Christian. You're a Christian that happens to be white. If you're from Europe or Australia or wherever, if you're a Christian, that is your identity first. That's what he says. Again, I'm not making this up. That's what God tells us, that we are citizens. When we come to Christ, we're pulled out of our cultures into the culture of the church, of the kingdom of God. I mean, think about during these times. You had slaves 
and free people, you had Jews and Gentiles worshiping together, loving one another. When I mean, think about the Good Samaritan. It was a slap in the face to the Pharisees because Jews hated Samaritans. And Jesus used the Samaritan as an example of someone who was good in God's sight and showed mercy. And so this is so important because when Paul says conduct yourselves, wor- conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, the gospel itself is what we, we're, we, we testify to the world that we have been saved by Christ, that we've been called out of darkness and sin, and we're the church. Well, that means that is where our citizenship lies first. And so if we are the church, then we need to act like it. And that means that there is no racism within the church. There better not be, right? We're the same. It doesn't matter what, how much melanin you got in your skin, right? How much or less you have. That has nothing to do with God saving us. And we are to love one another and show compassion and kindness and gentleness to one another, no matter who we are, where we come from, what our economic status is, what our color of our skin is. God doesn't care, right? James 2, don't show partiality. He talks about the rich and the poor there. You know, and who was it that came, that came to Jesus when he was on the earth? It was prostitutes and tax collectors and all the down and out of society. All the wealthy people, did. most of them didn't, right? And, and so that's what, that was so offensive to the Pharisees. Why are you eating with those sinners? And so as we think about conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, right off we have to realize that we are citizens of the church, of the kingdom of God, and we need to act like it in loving one another and loving all people, no matter where they come from, whether they smell bad or not, whether they have a job we think is good or not, whether they have a rundown home or a big home. It doesn't matter, right? Because we are all equal. We've all, we're all, we're, we were all the enemies of God, and we've all been saved by His grace. And we're all kept by His grace. And there's no one who can say, look at me. I mean, Paul himself said, I'm the chief of sinners. And it's so important that in a society that's trying to push all of us into our own group with our own agenda, that we say, no, we are the church and we have God's agenda. And we have this, this, not a sinful pride, but this honor of who we are as the citizens of the kingdom of God. I mean, we just spent a week with telling the kids in BBS there's two kingdoms, right? The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of the, 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 he rules the world. And we're the kingdom of God, and so we need to act like that and be citizens that are honorable, that live in a way that is pleasing to our king of our society. That's so important today. And he says, then conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Our lives must match our message. I mean, how many times have you heard somebody say, I'm not going to that church because it's full of a bunch of hypocrites, right? Why would I be a Christian? You live exactly the same way I do, right? I mean, have you ever heard that? I mean, and it is true. There's a lot of people that don't ever come into darken the door of a church building because they look at Christians and the immorality and the wickedness and the hate of their life and go, why would I want to be like that? You're no different than me. Right? That's what Paul, again, remember Paul saying, I'm, I'm staying for your progress and joining the faith, and this is the big thing I want to tell you. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And he's going to go into this unity in this. The gospel says that we're freed from sin. Do you live like that? Not that we're perfect. Not that we don't struggle with sin, right? But we say to the world, come to Jesus. He loves you and he'll free you from sin. And he'll give you victory over sin. And yet, what do people of the world look at the church and go, but look at your life? You you see how important this is? It matters how you live. 
Your life is a mirror reflecting Jesus Christ. And when the world looks at you, they're expecting to see something of Christ. It matters how we live. Does God forgive? Yes. Is God full of mercy and grace? Yes. Right? Christ died for our sins because we can't be good enough. And we're going to struggle. We're going to battle with sin. But it's one thing to be struggling and battling with it. It's another thing when this is, this is what my life always looks like. Does that make sense? You know, the difference? That's what John, first, in 1 John, John says about practicing sin. My lifestyle, what I get up and, and try to figure out how to do, and I, and I just walk in sin and immorality and, and hate and all those things. Paul says you can't do that. We're citizens of the kingdom of God, and if we're proclaiming a gospel that says Jesus will free us from our sins, we ought to act like it, right? There should be victory over your, you know, I tell people, it's not that we're sinless, but we should sin less as we grow in Christ. Does that make sense? The longer you're a Christian, you're not sinless, but you should sin less and less. Those things that you did as a new believer, you've gotten victory in your life, and, and you're still struggling with these things, and, and then the more you grow in Christ, He's going to show you some new things, right, that need to be worked on in your life. And that's a, that process of growth. But, I mean, again, you know, I, I told my Sunday school class this this morning, when I was in Idaho, one of the guys, my friends and my cousin, he's a homosexual guy, and his dad was a pastor, and his dad was very harsh and legalistic on him, and so he was, dad was super mad and hard on him when he became a homosexual. Well, when his dad died, who was a pastor, they found out he had been having an affair for over 20 years. So this guy has a very terrible look on Christians because of his own father. Do, do you see? What, that's what I'm talking about. We, we say this gospel frees us, and, and yet when you, you know, it's like Ravi Zacharias. Man, eloquent as everything. Never preached the gospel, though. Never preached God's word. But he died, and they found out what he, how he had lived for decades. And it was very immoral. That's what we're talking about. Not that we don't battle sin and struggle and fall on our face sometimes. But, but you know, it's, it's this whole thing of, of we're saying this, and then when we live these wicked lives, it, it says something to the world. Here's what the Bible says. Therefore, if anyone is, is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. I mean, has your life changed? I mean, again, not that we're perfect, right? That's sanctification. We're growing. We're being conformed to the image of Christ. It takes time. But is your life any different from the time when you became a Christian? Is there growth? Is, is the old passed away and you have these new things coming in your life? Do you see that in your life? Acts 14, 15. Men, why are you doing these things? This is Paul preaching. Now, look what he says. This is when they're trying to worship him as a god, as, as Zeus and Hermes. I think it was him and Barnabas. We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should what? Turn from these vain things to a living God. The gospel we preach is turn from sin and the wickedness of the world and trust in Christ, right? But if we live lives of idol worship, that's a problem because that goes against the gospel that we preach. And the gospel we preach, like Paul said to these idol worshipers, we preach a gospel that says you turn from those things. But we know that the law, this is 1 Timothy 1, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, right? The law and the scriptures was never given to make us righteous. It was to show us we need righteousness. It was made for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching according to what? The gospel. 
The gospel that should be, when we preach the gospel, again, we should be preaching that sin is evil and you must turn from it, right? That's the gospel. Are we living that way is what Paul is saying. 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. That's the gospel we preach. And Paul said here to the Corinthians, there's only there's two things that Paul told people to flee from. Flee sexual immorality and flee idolatry. Run away. Run away. You know, run forest. Run, right? Keep running. Just keep running right? Run away, because these things are deadly. But do you see what Paul says here? You have been bought with the blood of Christ. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and don't you dare put immorality and unite yourself to sexual immorality. That's what he's saying. And and that's why this whole thing that we see in our society, not just Sex, heterosexual immorality, but homosexual immorality. And, you know, Jesus said, if you lust, it's adultery, right? Hebrews 13 says, anything that's beyond the marriage covenant between a man and a woman married, biblical marriage, anything beyond that is sexual immorality, and God will judge it. Hebrews 13, God is clear on these things. And so as God's people, we should live according to what God has said. Again, not that we don't ever mess up, but that this is how we live our lives. Our lives show this. What else should, should the gospel do in our lives? What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You know... Christians are, in my life, Christians are some of the worst people I've ever dealt with. You know, there's times like with, with different, there's, I don't ask a lot of Christians, I have more here than anywhere to work on my house. Jim's been over working on my house. I, I trust him. There's a lot of Christians in my life that I, I don't trust them because they're not trustworthy. Right? I, I mean, there's some people that have done some really raw deals. And I hear that from a lot of people. If I want something, you know, if I have a business transaction, anything dealing with money, I'm not going to talk to a Christian. I'm going to go to somebody that's not one because they'll be more honest with me. Like, that's a problem, isn't it? Right? If, if, we, if we could trust anybody, it needs to be us, the church. We should be trustworthy. I mean, have you ever walked around... Christians, and they're some of the most depressed, discouraged, mean people, right? And I can be like that. Some of you know that. (laughs) My family does. I can be mean, right? But what should the Holy Spirit do in our lives? Bring love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? That should be happening in our lives, not just when everything is going well, right? but even in times that are hard. And it, we should be growing in that. John 15, 10, Jesus said, if you, uh, you will abide in my love if you obey my commands. Obedience is something that should mark the life of a Christian, that we obey the word of God. We love God's word, and we are striving to obey it. Conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Uh, look at Philippians 2, 14. Man, when we get here, this is one of those passages that's so difficult. Philippians 2, 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. That's complaining. 
Man, is that rough or what? <laughs> I mean, think about it. Okay, who, who in here has complained this week? Okay, I'll raise my hand. Yeah, right? <laughs> Paul says, do everything without complaining or grumbling. I can tell you that there's some times that, you know, my family can hear me grumbling under my breath or grumbling with my, with my out loud, <laughs> right? And yet, he, look at what Paul says, right? We are to live differently. And he goes on to talk about us holding the word of life out in a crooked and depraved generation so that we shine like stars in the universe. That as we live according to the gospel, it is a testimony, it's a light to the world. It matters how we live. We proclaim the gospel, but our lives back it up. And so, if we're proclaiming one thing and we're living this way, what do we call that? Hypocrisy. Right? And Paul's telling them, and the Philippians are a strong church. It's not like they're some weak, you know, real sinful church. But he's saying, this is important. Above all, I want you to get this for your progress and joy in the faith. We are to live consistent with God's word. That's called integrity. And Proverbs says, He who walks in integrity walks securely. Be holy in all your behavior. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. What does the word holy mean? Be set apart. Be set apart. Your behavior, my behavior should be set apart and look different from the world. And it should be a, a manner worthy of the gospel. So then Paul goes on, if you go back to verse 27, and he says, so that whether, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you, that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So we're called to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, and then he says, and this is how you live a life worthy of the gospel. So conduct ourselves, but now he's going to show us how to live a life that is worthy of the gospel. The first thing he says is to stand firm. Stand firm in the Lord. Let me give you a few verses here. This fly won't leave my notes alone. I'm going to kill it. Philippians 4.1, Therefore, my beloved brethren. See, now he's getting in my face. <laughs> We're going to have a problem. But I'm not going to be angry in sin, right? Because I'm going to show love. To the fly. Okay. Therefore, my beloved brother, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord. Just give you a few passages. Ephesians 6, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. 1 Corinthians 16, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Galatians 5, 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free, therefore keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So what's Paul saying here? The word stand firm, the Greek word is a, it's a military term. And it means to steadfastly hold one's ground regardless of the danger or opposition. So if you're in the military and you're taking ground, you're going against another army, you are standing firm means it doesn't matter how many people or what weapons they throw at you, you're not running. You will stand your ground no matter what opposition you face. And the first thing Paul says here is we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. How do we live that out? We stand firm in the Lord. Our strength comes from the Lord. And we're standing in Him. Okay? Regardless of what the world throws at me, I am not going to turn tail and run. You're not putting a C on my forehead. I'm not a coward. I'm going to stand no matter what happens. So think about what does it mean to stand firm in the Lord. If we're standing firm in Christ, that means we stand firm and we hold to the doctrine 
and the behavior of Jesus. The truth that Jesus taught, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word of God. We hold to the Word of God. We are going to stand upon the Word no matter what lies society throws at us. We will not cower, and we will hold forth God's Word. We're going to stand on it. But we're also going to stand on the behavior of Christ. And how did Christ behave? He confronted religious hypocrisy. He confronted sin, and he loved all people. Even on the cross, those who were killing him, what did he pray? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. What did Stephen pray as they're stoning him to death? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That's the love of God. And as we stand firm in the Lord, we're standing firm in His Word and in His behavior. We stand for truth. We stand for righteousness. And we stand against lies and stand against sin, stand against Satan. That's why the church should be involved in putting an end to child trafficking. We should do something because we stand against evil and murder. That's why we take a stand with abortion. Because it is, it's, it's of the devil. It is murder. It just is. And so, as God's people, if we stand firm in the Lord upon the Word of God, we have to stand against evil. It's not that we hate anyone, right? I just read to you in Ephesians 6, the battle's not against flesh and blood. We're not warring against people. We're warring against the one who is ruling this world. And that is Satan and his demons. The ones who are pre- is oppressing and driving all this wickedness. But as God's people to stand firm in the Lord, we are standing against evil and we're standing for what is true and righteous and good and loving. And how do we stand? How does Paul, he tells us this in, the, the, uh, in Ephesians 6, Therefore take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. In order to stand in God's word and to stand against the evil and to stand for what's good, we have to put on the armor of God, right? Gird your loins with the truth. That means truthfulness, preparedness. These guys wore like dresses back then. That's what we would call them. They, you know, they were long, flowing. They looked like a dress to me, right? But what, would they fight with those just flopping around everywhere? They would take it and they would tie it up with a belt. The belt of truthfulness, preparedness. They were ready. Tying up, girding your loins is what the Bible says. That was being prepared for battle. They were like that. All the, they didn't just do that when they went out onto the battlefield. That was way before they ever went to battle. They girded up their loins. They tied in all the loose ends of their dress. I'm just going to call it a dress, okay? You know what I mean. They tied in the loose ends. If we're going to stand firm, you've got to tie in the loose ends of your life. Those things flopping around out there that just keep dragging you down, you've got to tie that up. You got to bring in the loose ends to stand firm. And it goes on, put on the breastplate of righteousness. The the breastplate covered your vital organs. And 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 what what do we cover those with? Righteousness. And the, the heart is the seat of the emotions. Think about that one. When you live a life, or if I or somebody, a Christian, lives a life that's not righteous, we're going to be depressed, disappointed, and discouraged. Because the thing that guards our heart and our bowels, that's the seat of the emotions in the Scriptures, the thing that guards that is righteousness. And if you're walking in sin, you have no breastplate on. And the seat of your emotions can be attacked by the enemy. That's why living a godly life is so important. Not just because that's what God tells us, but for your own joy and peace and your your own well-being. It matters how we live. And then he says, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace is the peace of God between you and him. Not just that you have peace inside, but that you are at peace with God. You've been reconciled. 
Your sins, your debt has been paid for. You've been born again. You are now right with God. You have peace with him. You're no longer his enemy. It's the gospel of your salvation. That's what gives you the the boots to stand on. And those Roman soldiers, you remember we've talked about this before, they wear these boots with super thick soles because they didn't have landmines back then, but they would sharpen these stakes and they would set up all these traps. And if you stepped on one of those stakes, it would go right through your foot. And guess what happens if you got a stake this big around sticking through your foot? How's that going to help you in a battle? You're done. You're dead. Because you, you can't stand. The gospel of your salvation, remembering that you are at peace with God, that you're born again, that you belong to Him, that He is for you, He's not your enemy, that is your salvation, is what keeps you from those traps of the enemy. It's what grounds you. I mean, any sport, are the shoes important? Yeah. I mean, ask somebody in basketball or or any kind of track or cross country, any sport. What you have on your feet can mean the matter of winning or losing. It's important. Same with standing firm in the Lord. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith. Faith, again, it's not a little bitty round shield. It's a shield that's like a door that you get behind with your life in which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Guys, standing in, in firm in the Lord means there's times that you don't understand the circumstances that are going on, but you say, Lord, I trust you. I trust your word. I trust who you are and who you say you are, even though I don't understand what's happening, and, I, and it really, I'm really struggling with what's going on in my life, but I trust you. That is the shield of faith. It's so important. That extinguishes the flaming arrows of the evil one. The helmet of our salvation. That's your glorification. That God saved you by your, His grace, and He's keeping you by His grace, and you are already in Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. You cannot lose your salvation. That you, your glorification, your eternity is secure in Christ. That is the helmet that guards your mind, your thinking, your, your brain, that is the helmet of your salvation, and of course, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. These are the things that we use as we stand firm in the Lord. Without those, we're in big trouble. Notice, though, that he just he says, stand firm in the Lord with one spirit, one mind. That, that simply means, it's, that's not the Holy Spirit, that is our inner man. It, it's, he's, it's the attitude that we have. It's living in harmony. This is the unity of the church, that we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, that we stand firm in the Lord in one mind, in one spirit. We live in harmony with one another. And in this one mind, one spirit means we're single-minded. We function, the NIV says we, we contend as one man. We are as one person. Our attitude, our focus, our purpose is the same. It's not that we come up with one. Our purpose, our focus, our thinking, our our heart is according to what God has said our purpose is. And we are together on this. We're different, aren't we? We come from different backgrounds, different places. We have different hobbies and different loves and things that we like. And we're different. But we are one in Christ. And we are to strive together to be of one mind and one spirit as as we stand firm in the Lord. You cannot, and I want to say this, you cannot stand firm by yourself. You can't say, oh, I'm a Christian. I don't need to be part of a church. I don't need to be involved in a church. It cannot be. Because you can't be in one mind and one spirit with a body and not be part of it. You have to be there. You have to be involved. That, that's this whole thing of unity, and that's what Paul's reminding the Philippians, that you are, that our focus is the gospel. We're standing in the Lord, but we're standing together. And so you have to be together, right? I mean, I, I've said this before. You can't you know, be a quarterback of a college football team and do it off of Zoom, Right? But we want, to, we want to do church that way. 
You can't do that. I'm not, it's not me telling you that. It's what the Word of God says. We have to be together, working and functioning, fellowshipping, loving together so that we can be of one mind and one spirit and live in harmony. I mean, some people say, we'll live in harmony as long as you're out there and I'm over here. It doesn't work that way with God's people. That's not what God has set up for us. This is the unity of the church. We're single-minded. We move as one person. We are to be that connected, that in love with one another, having the same attitude, seeing the Scriptures. It's not, you know, as we work through the Scriptures that, that we believe the doctrine, the teaching of God's Word. We hold to the Word of God, and we are as one man. We're not a bunch of individuals. And then he goes on and he says, striving together for the faith of the gospel. This is the key here. As we stand firm in the Lord together, of, we, we're in harmony. We're in one accord. You know, that's a push for Honda, right? We're in one accord, right? Did you guys catch that? That's one of my dad jokes. <laughs> so as we're in one accord together, he then says we're to strive together for the faith of the gospel. Here's the great purpose of the church. The word striving together in the Greek is a compound word. This is, this is the word I said at the beginning that means where we get our word athletics from. And it, the striving together is where we get the, our word athletics, and it's a team sport here. It was used as a team sport See, I love Paul. He liked athletics. He liked sports. Like, he uses them all the time. But notice that they strive together for what? For a great purpose, the gospel. You remember the, the Redeem team? You remember when in the Olympics, when the, the U.S. basketball team, you know, at first it was the dream team. And they had Magic Johnson and Larry Bird and, and Michael Jordan, you know, the greatest players of all time. Right? Not these new guys, sorry. Those guys could play together. But when, when these other guys in 2008, well, started I think in 2004, we started getting destroyed in the Olympics. Because we had all these amazing athletes and they couldn't play together. So they bring the Redeem team and they got Coach K, Mike Krzyzewski from Duke. And they had Kobe Bryant and LeBron James and some other guys. And when Coach K came, they, all the, the other coaches were really worried that he was going to, because Coach K is from West Point, and he runs Duke like that. And he was going to come in with these, these multimillionaires, these best players in the world, and he was going to run them off. Because they're not going to, they don't want to listen to anybody. They don't want to be coached. They don't want to be encouraged. I was reading this article from Sports Illustrated on this whole thing. And they were really concerned because LeBron James was the main one they were concerned about. And if he won't, if, if he wasn't going to be part of the team, that it would destroy the whole team. I mean, these guys are, I mean, you guys remember Kobe Bryant. I mean, these guys are salty Best players in the world, right? They couldn't play together. And so they're trying, Coach K is trying to bring these guys together, and he had a really good relationship with Kobe Bryant. And he had known him for a long time, had a really good relationship, and that helped him. But he had to figure out a way to get these guys to come together to win gold. And their great purpose was the gold medal and bring some pride back to America in the basketball world. That was their great purpose. And that great purpose helped those guys who wouldn't play together to play together, to put aside their differences and, and all of that. And, and even though Coach K was a college coach and not a professional coach, put that aside and win gold. And they had to come together. It was this huge thing. And it, and it happened. And then in 2008, 2012, 2016, they won gold. But, but that's what we're looking at here. The church, we have all these people that God has saved. And there's some talented people. And people, everyone has spiritual gifts. And yet so many times, we can't play together. And, and, and then we, you know, we could come together and have the wrong purpose. 
We are to strive together as a team, as one man, for the gospel, for the progress of the gospel across planet earth to the glory of God. That is what the Lord calls us to do. So I want to encourage you this morning as we think about this, we have got to come together that our great purpose is the great commission, right? To take the gospel to the planet. And I want to read this this one. This is in Acts 15. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, this is Paul, they were passing through Phoenician Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and what happened to the church. It brought what? Great joy. See, as the church comes together and proclaims the gospel, and our purpose and striving is the gospel, people coming to Christ and the church growing and moving across the planet, as we see God work, It will bring great joy to the church. That's what we see right there with the Apostle Paul. That's what God is calling us to do. And so I want to encourage you this morning. Are you living in a way that measures up to the gospel? Not perfection, but that you're a new creature in Christ. Are we as a church one man, one person? We have the same focus, the same purpose, that we love one another. Yeah, we're going to disagree at times. Yeah, we're going to struggle with one another at times. But because we love one another and because we are one in Christ, we forgive. We work and move forward and move through things and come out stronger together just like a good marriage relationship. It's not without conflict, but we move through it. We work together because we are the the citizens of the kingdom of God. And we have the spirit of God, and we are one person in Christ, and we have one purpose. And we must come together for that great purpose and not lose sight of what God has for us in this life. And Paul ends this section of chapter 1 with, it's not only been granted to you to believe. We talked about that in Philippians 1.6, how God does the saving. But he says, it's also been granted to you. And that word granted is charis, where we get our name, charis fellowship. It's been granted to you to suffer for his sake. Persecution and suffering for the sake of the gospel is a gift of God's grace. Man, we don't see it that way, do we? (laughs) That's hard, right? But that's how he ends this part. And then he goes, therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of his love, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, of the same love, of the same purpose. We're going to struggle. We're going to be persecuted. If we hold to the word of God... As things continue, people aren't going to like us, right? Because we're in a a fallen world. But we hold forth the truth together. United, we what? Stand. And divided, we fall. That's been true through the history of all mankind. No matter what culture you're from, no matter what time period you lived in, if you're united, you stand. If you're divided, you fall. Satan will try to divide us. And sometimes through stupid things, right? Like the color of carpet or paint or something. Right? I remember talking to David James about padding in the pews. And people were mad. Like, I would like that. Right? <laughs> or air conditioning. Like, that's good, right? But, but we get in these things where we get in these fights over stuff that doesn't matter. And because of the grace given to us and the love of God, We are to love one another, and we're to work through these things and sacrifice for one another because we are one. So important that we get this, and we have one purpose. Let's not be like those millionaires that can't work together. Let's be the church. Amen? Lord, thank you so much. Lord, as the the band comes up, I just thank you for your word, for your grace. 
God, I thank you for your people that are sitting right here. And Lord, how you've worked in all of us. Lord, may we be, as Paul says here, may we be of one heart, one mind, one purpose. Lord, may we love one another. And may we have be united on that one purpose you've given us, the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you stand with us? never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes i will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name yes i will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days, yes, I will. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same god who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes i will lift you high in the lowest valley your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. I choose to pray. close let that be the prayer of our heart whether we're in the lowest valley or the highest high that we will we will praise the Lord we will worship him we will be on mission for his purpose but I want to encourage you this morning as we close if you're going through something difficult we are one that means you have to let us help you 
There's sometimes people want, you know, there's people here that want to help someone that's going through something. They're like, no, that's all right. We don't need any help. We'll just do it ourselves. And it's like, that's not part of being one. We're one. That means when one of us is hurting, we all hurt. Right? We mourn with those who mourn. We rejoice with those who rejoice. If you're struggling, let us know and, and let the body help you and encourage you and pray for you. I can't tell you how encouraged I was in all this back pain I've had. People praying for me, encouraging me. Like, I am thankful for that. And, and so let's be one. Amen? Lord, thank you for your people. Thank you for our time together. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, as we walk in unity together with that one great purpose you've given us, that, Lord, we'll be a people full of joy, the joy of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.